Why should mobile operators embrace cloud-native technologies as they progress with their 5G deployment work? And what exactly does it entail? I sat down with Frederick Kautz, Head of Edge Infrastructure at DocAI, and Taylor Carpenter, partner at the Vault Cooperative. I think it, it depends on uh, which which part of the uh, cloud or what part of the service provider that you're talking with. Um, the ones that I've spoken to, some of the things that they're looking for is number one, uh, they're looking at like 5G's coming around. So there's like increased scalability. There's uh, increased costs that they're looking at trying to control. Part of it is how do we control some of those costs? How do we make it easy to manage the system? And so uh, the cloud native approach uh, has a series of uh, principles and methodologies that if you follow those principles and method methodologies really helps you uh, hit that scalability, but at the same time keep your, keep your costs under control. From the enterprise side, the scalability is probably the, the largest piece and um, also the resiliency. So uh, traditionally you're going to focus on nothing should go down, obviously. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into that up front. That's why the time to market takes longer. So how do you do this and provide scalability? So there's a lot of um, the long processes that have been learned over many years that have gone into what cloud native is to make sure that the resiliency is there with failovers and everything else so that you don't have the downtime. The way that I've looked at, um, at cloud native network functions is we have like this concept of uh, an ideal net, uh, cloud native network function, which it follows all of the principles. Uh, it's, uh, they're set up so that you can upgrade them, downgrade them, uh, they scale horizontally. If they're designed so that if they fail, they don't cause you downtime, uh, they auto heal. So there's like a whole range of different principles that uh, we want them to follow. We know though that it's not going to be a light switch. We're not going to say, hey, we're all running uh, ideal CNFs now. So one, one of the things that we've been playing around with is the concept of a, uh, of a progression where uh, perhaps a, we still are trying to work out the definitions, but having like maybe a bronze, silver, and gold definition. And the concept behind it is if you start off with a bronze one, uh, you've, uh, you've, it, could, it may be a lift and shift to start off with, uh, but you've done certain types of things to make sure that it runs well within a uh, cloud-native orchestrated system like Kubernetes. So that means you have uh, no additional privileges that you've added in. Uh, you don't have any uh, specialized kernel uh, features that you have to inject in, in in specific ways, or if you do, uh, they're they're controlled in in a through device plugin uh, if you need a device or or uh, so on. And so part of what we're trying to but if you, and if you head towards gold, and then if you're closer to a to a more ideal one, you can scale horizontally and uh, and reduce your overall toil. And the thing that's going to be interesting is how do we, how do we define what like a silver one? So that's I think where the real uh, where the real discussion is going to be around this is like. Uh, if we des if we design it lower, then it means it's easier for people to to get on board and show a progression early on. But then in the long run, uh, actually may make the uh, the overall adoption a little bit more difficult because the path from silver to gold is just that much more harder. And the the hardest part is going to make be making that that progression. And so I th so I think part of it is we're trying to help guide. Uh, to help guide through, like here are the principles that we that we believe uh, are, will help, and then how do we help guide the community to uh, to achieve to achieve that and to be able to realize it? I think it's important to to dif uh, differentiate between containers and containerizing yeah. network functions, and then building cloud native network functions. So, a cloud native network function, you could argue that the underlying packaging or however you take all your software could be a VM or multiple other things. There could be something else beyond a container. So the important part is those principles. And if you're adopting those and you're following all of those, then I think you're gonna get benefits on whatever your underlying infrastructure and packaging format. So in that sense, maybe a container is helping move towards it and it's part of the interim stage and it's fine to do that, but the focus should be on the principles. If you're doing like a lift and shift, and you have something that's not cloud native, let's say it's like 
something that's designed to scale vertically, it's designed to, uh, it's, it's, it's not resilient to failure. You stick it into a container, now you have all the complexity of a container added onto it and you're not really getting the benefit out of it. So it's important not to just do the lift and shift, but to actually work towards that because you now have this orchestrated environment you have to recertify on top of and, uh, and retrain on and you don't realize the benefits of moving the cloud to a cloud native system in the first place. You can't tell everybody, stop your development and innovation on your current platform and wait. So you're going to keep merging back new innovation that's happening um, from the cloud native and the new technologies coming out. When they're ready, you'll just say, let's adopt some of those principles and some of the technology. You'll have 5G and the current NF um, platforms will keep moving forward. If you can get a focus on those principles, you can start developing on the 5G side with whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter what the technologies you're using right now. A lot of those processes and methodologies, they're not new to CNCF. <coughs> They've been around for years. It's taking them and putting them together. So start adopting them now. And then by the time that some of the technologies that you would want to use are ready, you're already ready to pick them up because you're using the processes and methodologies that you need for them. Yeah. I think uh, part of the trick is finding like what are the pain points that, uh, that people are running into today with their current infrastructure. And then we can uh, take a look at, is this something that cloud native will help solve? And I think that there's a, a variety of different types of problems that uh, we're able to integrate both of them together and solve real problems today. And that can be the first step towards, uh, towards uh, bringing in cloud native into these environments. And we may not move everything to cloud native uh, ever. I think it'll be a, a mixture. Like we'll have things that work really well in cloud native. There'll be some things that work really well in their current existing environment. And so uh, you, you, Maybe something new. Yeah, like we still we still run physical devices as well, and so like those PNFs, they still exist today. They still they still work. We can't just say, uh, okay, we'll, we'll never have any of those of those again. And so it, a better question becomes, how do we integrate between all of these different environments in an effective way that uh, reduces the overall complexity of managing all of these things as a as a system, and not just have an isolated. Uh, environment that is your cloud native and an isolated environment that is your open stack or your physical devices. Within the telecoms, you may say the infrastructure that's out there isn't following all that, but I bet you all of them have some parts that are using pipelines and CICD that are following the principles, because that's been building up for 20 years. On, before the DevOps name, it was a lot of little pieces. And so cloud native is taking DevOps um, plus 12-factor apps, or how do you do your development, how do you do different things, putting it all together and saying, here's a bunch of principles, best practices, that we say can give these benefits. If you want these benefits, you can adopt them. If they don't fit, great. There's other things. But it's mainly use well-defined principles and best practices. Historically, uh, telcos often see themselves as like the uh, they're the big fish or like the large uh, the large entities. And what's happened in the uh, Kubernetes space is that if you look at the entire Kubernetes space that's uh, that's there, the enterprise space is absolutely massive and uh, and out dwarfs the uh, the telcos uh, when you take them in their entirety. And so part of what ends up happening is they have a tremendous amount of resources to to get this right. And so the Kubernetes orchestrator um, has is the second largest uh, open source project in existence behind Linux behind the Linux kernel. And so the amount of effort that's gone into stabilizing such a such a system is is massive. And so my recommendation would be to not reproduce, not fork and reproduce, but instead to try to work out how to stay in sync with the enterprise community. Let the enterprise side take the risk. Like all the startups and medium-sized corporations will adopt early and then 
the, inter the large enterprises will then adopt when the risk is low, and then Telco can then adopt on top of that once they know what works and what doesn't, and uh, help stabilize the entire system. So I think the trick is to not bifurcate the Kubernetes community, community but try to work out ways to interact with the Kubernetes community and to be a part of the uh, part of the ecosystem. And I think that if we can find a way to do that in the short term, it'll be. It, it'll, it's definitely more difficult to do this in the short term, but in the long term, I think there's massive implications of being a part of that community rather than being a separate, a separate entity. Excellent. Knowing that if you're joining these other communities that may not be directly focused on what you as maybe the talk, uh, the whole domain, but also a specific SP. Yes, they're not focused on just that, but they're going to cover stuff that you aren't even looking for and handling cases as you scale out and realize, oh, we didn't know we need this, but now that we're at 5G and we're triple the size, how do we handle this sort of thing? Well, being part of that community, and that's part of the cultural shift, and then within that, you're gonna get a lot of the best practices and everything else to understand um, how to handle those things. And you have stuff that the telcos care a lot about, which is risk assessment and risk um, handling all the issues with the failures and stuff like that, there's different ways that they found with these principles to view it. Um, so it's understanding how do they look at that to solve our problems. Yeah, in fact, uh, the largest enterprises eventually start to look like service providers themselves. So when you start looking at the active service activation account, the way they manage their accounts, uh, the uh, having to have multiple data centers that they have to deal with, uh, like there, there's a lot of similar overlapping issues. And so, uh, so in the in the long run, as as Kubernetes and cloud native really start to take off in those environments, I believe that both uh, enterprise and telco can succeed can succeed together in this space rather than uh, trying to build two separate things that just don't uh, ever talk with each other.